What's up, guys? We're here to talk about Charles Barg's drawing course. Charles Barg was a dude who was around in the 19th century, I guess. He worked a lot with this guy, Jean-Léon Jerome, on a drawing course. They came up with a series of plates that they recommended students copy from. These were originally 18 by 24 inches, and you would copy them exactly. It used a couple of uh, novel ideas that I prefer over like a grid transfer, and I think they are really good for training your eye. So once you've done a few Charles Bark plates, you can imagine this is like a painting canvas, and over here is like a mountain scene that you're actually looking at, or a person that you're actually painting at. And in the same way that you can transcribe one piece of paper over here, you can transcribe reality onto this. It's freely available, it's Creative Commons, it's like super old. It's broken up into a couple of sections. The first is these basic plates, which have the simple idea of how to start your drawing and then how to get fine finish. The next is on art history. I think it's so important to copy from the best artists in the world because initially you compare yourself to them and then you feel bad and you, you lay down and you take a depression nap. But then you study them, you try and absorb their methods, and you become a better artist as a result. And then lastly, they have a few treatises on how to approach figure drawing in the real world. Let's talk about materials. I have a giant cup of coffee. That's number one. Don't mix your coffee cup up with your paint water. I've also got a ruler. Rulers are very handy for plumb lines. We'll get into that later. I've got this HB pencil or a 2H pencil, which is a very light, very hard lead. And so when you put a line down, you can barely see it. I also have a micron, which I'll be using for my equivalent of this, because it doesn't really show up on screen, really. This is how light I should be drawing, and how light you should be drawing. You can see it, but can you see it right there? Probably not. So for my purposes, I'm going to be using a micron and going a little harder at times. I then prefer to use vine charcoal. The real thick ones are really cool, and if you just rub it with your hand like this on a piece of paper for a while, it gets this fine chisel tip, and it's really good. You get the ability to shade in areas or go back to a fine edge. And fine charcoal is awesome in that it takes a lot of abuse. You know, you can lay down a little bit of this, smudge it away, and erase basically half of it. So you can push and pull your values really well. And then lastly, uh, you have to finish up with the darkest darks of the painting. So I use a 2B pencil or a 2B charcoal pencil. I also use block charcoal sometimes. And then there's a couple of tools you can use for cleaning up, such as a chamois, an eraser, there's a couple other tools I have. This is another kind of eraser. Needed erases, needed erasers are always needed. And these are really fun because you can just pull them and they get really soft and it's just a tactile sort of ASMR thing. Mm. But you can also whittle these down with your hand into a fine little point. And it's really good for just picking out details. And then of course, just blurring with your fingers is great. Using tissue paper is something that I'm going to do as well. And I really love this like makeup sponge. So, you know, go find your partner's makeup kit, cover it in charcoal so it's never usable again. A tortillon or blending stick. It's just rolled up paper. It's very good for fine details. You can actually cut this with a knife as well. You can see a little bit of that where I trimmed it down. You should use nice paper, but uh, you know I want to caveat good supplies here. First off, I do have a, a pad of newsprint under that, and that makes it nice and cushy, and that's good to draw on. But I don't think supplies are too important when you're starting off. Uh, you know, I remember being a kid, and when my elementary school started recycling in second grade, we could just dig through the recycling bin and take as much paper out as we want, and take it home and draw on the backs of math tests and stuff. It was probably a FERPA violation. However, I just had so much fun rifling through garbage for free art supplies. And 
I didn't have the skills necessary to make it worthwhile to spend a lot of money on all this, all these fine tools. And I don't think necessarily that I still am. I think you know developing skills is more important than hoarding supplies. So don't necessarily go to the art store and break the bank. So let's get started. So the first thing that we want to do is get a single line that's going to represent uh, a guiding light for everything that we do. And again, I'm going to use a micron, even though it's going to mess up the values. But you can see it on Charles Bark's guide here, which is this line going straight through here. And I can reasonably assume I can make this straight up and down. Uh, it's good to do this with your uh, art on an easel so that it's oriented towards you. Otherwise, you'll get perspective distortion. And also, like you can't really compare and contrast. And also, this is going to train you for stuff that painting is going to use later. You never paint necessarily by looking down on it, right? You're at an easel with a paintbrush. So I'm going to start with that guide, and I'm going to try and make it about equidistant. The great thing about having similar supplies is you can just cheat. So I can reasonably assume it's right there. Next, I need to make sure that I have the dimensions from the farthest left and right point as well. You'll notice that on this, it's either this bottom cast, if you want to go off of that, or you could use this head. I think uh, I'm going to use this bottom. I'm going to use the head, because that's really great. And if you're doing this physically with a ruler, you can do this. But what I oftentimes do is I will do compare and contrast. So if you stretch your arm out as long as possible, it's going to stay the same for whatever you do. And as a result, I can do something where I measure with my pencil or my ruler until I've got the top to the bottom here. So like I could put this, and it's going to be different on the camera, but I'm measuring this so that the top of my ruler is at the top of his head and my thumb is at the bottom of his chin. Then I'm going to turn this exactly but make sure that you're oriented towards this. And it's about two-thirds uh, two of the distance. So I'm just going to make a note of that. So a plumb line is a very important part of the Charles Park system. It takes a lot of the guesswork out, and it lets you be a little more analytical in your art. You might not be able to just nail a face immediately, but you can probably reasonably figure out a straight up and down line or a straight horizontal line. We can actually compare anything. And you can actually use something called a plumb bob, where it's a weight on a string, and therefore gravitationally guaranteed to be straight up and down. I'm just eyeballing this. And what's great about plumb lines is when you're sight size drawing, you can make sure that this is exactly the same spot. Technically since for sight sizing. We could also cheat even more and measure it. So this was an 8-inch-ish line. Mine is a little So I think mine is like there. Actually, let's go to this line. So this line is about 8 and 1 millimeter. And I want this to be at the 4 millimeter. So that's going to be exactly identical. This is going to give us an envelope for figuring out where everything else in this drawing is. Next up, you're going to start adding plumb lines for other things, specifically anything that is a major landmark. So for instance, we started with this eye plumb line. Next up, I'm going to do the nose. And you should try and just figure out how to draw straight lines without needing a ruler, if possible. So there's kind of where the nose is. Maybe a little higher up. The mouth line is right there. It's good to space this out. So I would recommend perhaps doing like the chin first. And these sort of marks are going to make sure that you stay in your lane. It really sucks when you draw an eye and you're not planning ahead and you get feature creep, and suddenly your eye is too big and it's drifted into your nose, 
and then your nose ends up down here. And so you keep letting everything lengthen or shorten until the head looks like nonsense. We know that his chin is going to be here, his mouth is going to be here now, and his nose is going to be there. So next up, I'm going to start drawing using the Charles Barg system, which tries to break things down into only points, lines, and planes. We're starting with the points. And I actually am going to use my 2B pencil, or my 2H pencil. And I'm going to try and always use a, an arcing motion of my arm so that my lines are very straight. I believe in the Repin Academy in Russia, they specifically make you only draw with straight lines as possible, as often as possible. And I'm going to start by trying to figure out where these features are. And it can be like big ideas. I'm also going to start using heads measurements. Heads measurements in my system is more of a metaphor than an actual head. When you figure out that how big the human body is, you measure it by the number of heads off, oftentimes when you're starting off. You can use anything as a metaphorical head. So for instance, the distance from the nose to where the nose ends, where his beard is, is about the same distance. So if I figure out that the nose is like that big, you can say the cheek is right there. There's also about a nose's distance from there to the hair. And the hair lands somewhere around there. So in other words, point number one, point number two, point number three. We're going to try and simplify this as often as possible. And we're going to continue using plumb lines. When you do this enough, it starts being something instinctual. So when I look at something, I don't have to hold my pencil up anymore and figure it out. I just automatically assume that what I should do is see this corner of the nose, pull it up, and compare where that ends up being for the eye. So as a result, these kind of are at the same point. And I'll put it right there. Don't be too afraid of putting down an incorrect line. The only way you learn how to draw is by drawing. And so even if you make an incorrect line, that's better than making no line. So for instance, this corner of the beard happens slightly under the nose. A lot of this is trying to break this down into something that's uh, less tied into our human psyche, I think. Uh, it's very easy to overanalyze stuff and try and draw the emotion of the thing rather than the thing. And that can spiral out of control. And soon enough, you have animated characters with big eyes. You can have people where you draw like the horrible mountain top lips because you're thinking in this sort of iconography way of physical shapes. What we want to do is break this down into something that doesn't think in that way. So a lot of times I'm trying to figure out, first off, if I can at least get it right on the x or on the y-axis, how high up and down it is, then I can figure out other things about it. So I know that this beard line happens here. I know that this one happens right around here. I don't know if this is the right length of line or if I went too far, but I do know that it intersected that starting plumb line in the right spot. So where does his eyebrows happen? What do I think? Where does this happen? Where does the end of his hat land? Kind of right there. So Jean-Léon Jerome, one of the other people who worked on this book, was I believe one of the major artists at Ecole de Beaux-Arts, I'm saying that wrong probably, 
in France, but it produced some of the best. That's, it was a school that produced some of history's greatest artists. And supposedly, it was a bit of a, you know, a boys' club, and students who were seniors could really abuse the freshmen. You were allowed a place in the figure drawing room based on your seniority, and younger, uh, older students would sit right up front, and they would put up like a six-foot canvas, so the younger students couldn't actually see the model at all. And they would, you know, cause all sorts of animal house pranks. But uh, John Leon Jerome, who was a very militant, strict teacher, he would enter the room, and everyone would shut up, and just like. The lesson was started, and no more fun was allowed. Notice that we have this point for the tip of the lips and the bottom of the nose, or the crease of the lips and the bottom of the nose. His beard comes slightly above the halfway point. So if I make that mark there, that tells me where I start for this stuff. To truly do the bar drawing course right, you're supposed to like get it exactly perfect. Some artists spend like a whole year on a single drawing. I don't think I have that kind of patience, but I can definitely get something out of it. Now, after you get these basic figure points in, again, notice that I'm mostly using points in space and lines. At some point, you advance from the feature boundaries, where the beard starts with the hat, and you move into shadow boundaries. And shadows are another one of those things where people just don't draw them because we overthink it. And we're thinking in ideas rather than form. So if you can abstract this out to just a physical thing, imagine this is like this shadow under his chin here. Think of that as like, I don't know, a weird pipe or something. Or maybe it's a, uh, I don't know, I'm drawing a blank with this looks like. Maybe a worm with a big head. But all the time, you should be looking at shadows and trying to find what you think they look like. And I really like playing a game where I do cloud drawing with shadow shapes. I try and look at the shadow under somebody's eye and think to myself, that looks kind of like a bird or a fish. Same thing with like. This whole uh, hat, you probably can't just pull a hat out of your mind. But if you look at this and you see it as like a crescent moon, suddenly it makes more sense. I think I started that one a little too far. Again, always try to do quick motions, but light motions. You're going to draw straighter lines if you use your whole arm, and you'll draw better arcs as well. This is probably good enough for now as a start. And now I'm going to move into doing more of the modeling of the form for part two. Hey, everyone. This is Oscar Beckler. I'm a professor at Lake Washington Institute of Technology. Today we're working on Charles Bark plates and how to copy from them. Uh, it's the ground. So next up, let's advance. I think it's useful to compare these two images to begin with. So you can see how this is how you should think about things before you go into this. And I think a lot of times people get lost in the details. They want to draw the eyelashes rather than the eye socket. They want to draw the curls of the hair rather than the overall shape of it. And one of the things that I like about this system is it tries to break things that are complex and impossible 
down into simplistic ideas that are then more easy to translate. I think there's a couple of cheap tricks you can do. If you just take your glasses off, I mean, depending on if you have glasses, everything gets kind of blurry, and suddenly these shadow shapes become very easy. What you can do if you want to try testing this is try taking an image into Photoshop, blurring it, or take a photo with that's out of focus, and then try and draw an outline of the shadows or any value change that goes from dark to light. So I'm going to switch to my fine charcoal. It's got this nice fine point, but it also has this flat edge. And this is where the shadow modeling comes in. And what I love about this Charles Park system is we just have this paint by numbers kit now where we can sort of flood fill this with uh, shadow colors. I'm going to start on the top. And what I try to think about is that when trying to judge whether I'm doing like the right kind of art, if it was good for my development, then it was the right kind of art. Even if that's tracing. In fact, you could literally probably get pretty far as an artist just doing paint by numbers kits where you start off with somebody else's drawing. Or you just, you know, uh, use um, a Photoshop filter to trace a photo, and then you do the second step, and you skip all the placement. But what I like about the Charles Park system is that it breaks things down into just two categories, uh, or three categories. Number one, getting the right placement. That was step one, where we made sure all our elements were in the right place. Step two is getting the right value, which is how light or dark something is. So this is darker than that. And you'll eventually start noticing these things more and more. So you'll notice that that's very dark, but what I love about vine charcoal is it comes right off. So what I want to do right now is look at my drawing versus Charles Barg's drawing and ask myself how close I got in placement and value. And then the third one is just edge quality. So this here this is a hard edge boundary, where an object ends is oftentimes very hard. And then as the shadow dissipates in the penumbra, it has a soft edge. So for instance, what I can do here is draw down into that. And then blur. And then strengthen that darkness again. And then blur. I think you can look at art as two separate philosophical issues. Number one being self-expression, and number two being quality of the work. One is subjective and one is objective. We look at things for their human element and their subjective value because that's what appeals to us. And we want to know what culture this came from and who made it and what the story behind it was. Why were they obsessed with dinosaurs or whatever. Do they have a cultural background that matters? And are they using a medium in the way that people have traditionally done it? And the other thing is objective. Did it accomplish its goal? And if that goal was to represent life, mimesis, as the Greeks called it, and accurately transcribe what you were looking at, how well did it accomplish that goal? I think anything with a character or a face to it 
I think that there are objective values that you have to look for in an artist. Why do art if you're not going to do it well? And if your goal was to actually do it the right way. I mean, if you take an artist and you subtract objective skill, what you have is somebody who can post good opinions on Twitter. And a lot of times you have people with great objective skill, and they have nothing cultural to say. Those people also suck. So your goal as an artist should be, number one, always eat your vegetables, always do your morning push-ups, brush your teeth every night, metaphorically speaking. Also in real life, you should brush your teeth every night. So I'm trying to start with this flood fill idea of how to get these values accurate to the plate. And again, you can go a little more aggressive than you think you can with this vine charcoal because you can always blur on the opposite side. Another thing that I oftentimes uh, love to do is try and get the darkest darks in early. And if you know that it's the darkest point, like under the ear crease, or the nostrils, or the lip corners, or the shadow right here where your eye is going into your skull. Getting that darkness in early helps you gauge the values from lightest to darkest. So if you know it's the darkest value, and this is not the darkest value, you might have to adjust. What's great is I can turn and look at this on my computer monitor, and that's like the equivalent of stepping back and doing it from afar. And by the way, you should do that. Step away from this, go to the other side of the room, view it from afar, and you'll suddenly be able to see the values and the big problems a lot easier. So when I look at this from afar, uh, the big problem I can immediately see is this needs to be darker. And I think what's valuable about this is, you know, it translates into painting so well, but at every stage of this, I'm still just doing the three-step process. Did I place it in the right spot? Did I get the correct value? And did I make it the correct edge quality? Is it soft or hard or textured? That's it. All done. I gotta stop being a coward about this left eye. Let's just do it. I'm still scared of the eye. Here is the mind killer.
You can see it. At some point, perhaps, I'll switch over to my tortillon. Also known as a blending stump. So what's cool is if you get this dirty a little bit, it ends up being something that you can smudge that dirt around after the fact with some amount of consistency. So like if I need something that's like at a middle value, but I need a fine line of it, I can just get this dirty, put it down slightly darker.
So there you have it. This is my finished Charles Bard plate. Obviously, you can keep going on these forever. You can find intricate details in the hair and going and going and going and going. Uh, this is at a good state of done for me because I have to go to sleep. But I hope this was valuable. Let me know what you think.